Hi folks, this video is about variables and quantifiers, two other important concepts in FOL. Variables are like constants, they are both types of terms, and all terms are going to be written with all lowercase letters. So when you write a variable, it cannot be capitalized. But just to make it easy to tell at a glance whether some letter is a constant or a variable, we're gonna refer, we're gonna use the end of the alphabet for variables, and we're gonna use the rest of the alphabet for constants. So if you need a variable, we're gonna say first, just use the, the letter X. And if you need a second variable, then use Y. If you need a third one, use Z. Now, if you need a fourth one, then you can use you know, U, V, or W. There, these are some extra ones, just so you don't feel like you're gonna run out. Now, what do variables do? Well, they go in the argument places of predicates because we put terms in those things. So this says X is tall in a sense. But X does not just refer to one object. We cannot use X to name Xander or anything, a xylophone, something that starts with an X. That is not allowed. So if you have a friend named Xander, uh, you have to use some other letter to refer to them, like A or B or something. This will never function. X will never be a name in our language. Instead, variables are like pronouns in English. What, what a pronoun refers to can vary from one use to another, and that's exactly what variables do. They don't invariably refer to one object. They can vary from one thing to a ne the next. So if I'm at a dog park and I say like, it is tall, pointing to some dog, that it refers to that dog in that instance, but then somebody else can say, and it is short. And when they say the word it, it refers to the short dog. So that's the pronouns are very powerful because we don't need names for everything. It's, it's incredibly useful. Uh, and FOL, one, we need that exact same power in FOL. Now, let me say, even though variables go in the argument places of predicates, that does not make these things atomic sentences. These things are still incomplete in some sense. Because remember the recipe for atomic sentences. You need to put the right number of names in the argument places of the sentences, and variables are not names. Think of it this way. It is tall. If I didn't, if I didn't have a way of specifying what it means, then the sentence it is tall would not have a meaning. It would not be true or false. It is tall is only true or false if the object, that, if this refers to some object and that object is true or false. So if I just say tall X and I don't have some other aspect of the sentence that, refer, that makes X refer to something, then I haven't yet said something true or false. And that's why this thing cannot be a sentence. Our, we need bivalence. We need all sentences to have a truth value. And, and that's not satisfied yet. So in some sense, variables alone are semantically incomplete. They need to go with something else in order to get truth values. Well, that something else is quantifiers. So that's why variables and quantifiers are a natural pair. We're gonna have two quantifiers in FOL. We're gonna call one the universal quantifier, and that's the capital letter A for all. And sometimes I'll tell you in logic to sort of, to, to make really clear that this symbol is being used in a special way, they put A upside down. Uh, and we, you, we're going to use E, the letter E for exists, or the existential quantifier. Now, if you put the letter E upside down, it would just be E. So E goes backwards to be the existential quantifier, and A goes upside down. But it's really annoying to type those characters on a standard keyboard or on a phone. And so I'm going to just use the standard letter A for the universal quantifier and the, and the standard capital letter E for the existential quantifier. Now, what do these things mean? A just... The, the universal quantifier just refers to everything or all things. And what we, need, what we do is we connect it to a variable and we say that it binds that variable. So when I say all X or AX, read this as for all objects X, X is tall. That's what this says. And of course, this is just a notational variation. So these are two ways of saying the exact same thing. Uh, in your homeworks, I want you to always use the letter A. Type the letter A for all and type the capital letter E for exists. So when I say exists an X tall X, that just says something is tall there, or there exists something tall. There's many ways in English of making quanti quantity claims. Um, and uh, so these, these quantifiers are gonna be able to translate a whole bunch of different English types of English expression. Now, let me point out something really important. These things are not atomic sentences. Remember the recipe for atomic sentences. You have to take the right number of names and put that in the argument places of predicates. There are no names in these things. So these cannot be atomic sentences. Instead, these are complex sentences. Quantifiers are like connectives. They are ways of making more and more complex sentences. So don't confuse these things with atomic sentences. These, these are sentences of FOL, but they're not atomic ones. They're complex ones. 
Now, there's another aspect of, of quantifiers and variables, which is really important. And I want to see if you got this from the reading. So pause your videos, see if you know what the concept of free means. Pause your videos and tell me exactly which of the variables in this, in this uh, string of symbols counts as free or not. Okay, I almost said sentence, but this is actually not a sentence because there are free variables. So that's a problem. So in order to count as a sentence, even a complex one, there can be no free variables. All the variables need to be bound. So what, what we're talking about here is the concept of scope and scope determines what is free or bound. Scope is familiar from prop and bool. Connectives have scope. So quant this is nothing new. I'm just telling you quantifiers have scope just like connectives do. So connectives and quantifiers are, are very similar types of symbols. And additionally, the, the quantifiers are going to be like negation in that they have a default mode to be narrow scope. If I want this negation out front here to be wide scope, I have to put these parentheses in. And the same goes for this, connect, uh, this quantifier. If I want this to have wide scope, I would need some parentheses here. As such, it has narrow scope. So it would just operate on this predicate here, um, won an Academy Award. So this says something won an Academy Award. Now what I'm trying to say is Parasite won an Academy Award and everybody saw Parasite. But see, these, the answer to the question is three. There's three free variables because these variables are not inside the scope of any quantifier. And that means that this thing is still semantically incomplete. Remember, variables need quantifiers to give them meaning. So what we need to do is start adding some quantifiers. I'll take care of the, the Y part first. What this says is everybody saw X. You know, what I'm trying to say is everybody saw Parasite and it won an Academy Award, but I haven't yet succeeded. I've bound the Y now, but look, I've still got two free variables, these two Xs. So what I need to do is I need to increase the scope of this Y. I can't just add more existential quantifiers here because what I want to say that everybody saw is everybody saw Parasite. Everybody saw the movie that won the Academy Award. So that's why I insert these parentheses up here and here. Now I've given my existential quantifier wide scope. Now this has no free variables. That quantifier binds this X, it binds this X, this X, and this X. It binds every X inside its scope. So the scope of the existential is underlined in this purple, and then the scope of this universal quantifier is underlined here. And now finally, this is a sentence. This thing has a truth value. And what it says is, uh, something won an Academy Award, which is parasite, and everybody saw it. Um, okay, that's probably false. Not everybody saw it, but it depends upon, I guess, who we're talking about. We'll, we'll talk about um, that in one minute. So here's the concept of free versus bound. Free versus bound are properties of variables. Technically speaking, they're properties of instances of variables. You see, you might say X, the variable X has three instances in this sentence. The first two are bound, and then this one is free. Now, if I put some parentheses out here, then the scope of this quantifier becomes wide, wide on the, wider than the conjunction, and now all of those things are bound, and that thing is a sentence. And see, if I put another quantifier out front here, then the scope of this one is immediately on that one. I don't need parentheses, because this scope is immediately going to uh, be wide on that thing, and this thing has parentheses that make it wide. So there's the um, scope of those two variables. Now, we've been talking about things with free variables in them, and they're not sentences. Like, look at this, small x, this is not a sentence because that variable is free. And so this whole complex sentence is also not a sentence. I, let me, I just misspoke. This whole complex formula, this string of symbols is not a sentence because it has a free variable, namely this x. What we need is we need another word. You see, I'm misspeaking because I haven't told you the word yet. We need a concept called a well-formed formula or WFF, woof. You know, okay, I have to admit, it's gonna sound really silly when I say woof for a few times, but honestly, this is what logicians really do pronounce this word as. Uh, we say woof, and once, once I say it a few times, it's gonna stop sounding silly, and you're gonna stop laughing at me. Uh, so well-formed formulas have two types. If they have all closed variables, if they have no free variables, all the variables are bound, then we're gonna call them closed woofs, and that's just what a sentence is. So sentences, no sentence can have a free variable. Of course, no atomic sentence can have a free variable because no atomic sentence can have a variable period. But complex sentences, if they have any free variables, they're still not sentences. Uh, so I guess uh, that's a misnomer. Complex formulas with free variables don't count as sentences. Instead, those would count as open woofs. So an open woof 
is just a formula with some free variable in it, like small x, and a closed woof is just a, a formula with no free variables, and closed woofs and sentences, those are synonyms. So, so here's a bigger chart to make it a little clearer for you. Woofs have two varieties. So what's the relation between woofs and sentences? Sentences are a type of woof, are a type of formula. When I say formula, I'm going to use that as short for well-formed formula. Um, because there's still something grammatically well-formed about open formulas. You know, if I put cat X like this, this is still well-formed. It is a cat. And that's why this can appear as a constituent of this. If I had X capitalized or something, then the thing would not even be grammatically well-formed. So, so there's still something important about being grammatically correct, even if you're not yet a sentence. And that's, that's, that's what allows you to build complex sentences out of those things as little chunks or pieces. So sentences are types of formulas. They're the formulas that have no free variables in them. Okay, thanks.